So hello YouTube viewers and welcome along to a very special Winning Agenda live stream beginners video. My name is Jesse Marshall and what we're going to be doing today is part three of our Twilight Struggle for Beginners series. So we've already talked through the rules of the game in general, then we talked through early war strategy. Now we're going to be doing something a little bit more specific and talking through each of the cards in the early war deck. When to play them as either side, a few of their special features and perhaps some of the ways of thinking about them, either as the USA or the USSR, that might not be immediately obvious. So we're starting off here with Duck and Cover, which is a pretty important card for a number of reasons, and I think there are a lot of things to say about this card. The first one is the first line, degrade DEFCON one level. So anytime you see DEFCON degrading on a card, it's a really important thing to pay attention to. Because what it means is that if you are the USSR and you trigger this event, so if you play the card duck and cover as the USSR player, the event will trigger unless you're playing it to the sp sending it to the space race. If you do that and the USA player gets this event on your turn and De DEFCON degrades to one, you lose the game. So if you're the USSR player and you play this card, it's a way to kill yourself um, or to lose the game instantly if DEFCON is already at two. However, it can be of benefit to the USSR player if DEFCON is at three or higher and you want to either coup somewhere, say you want to coup Europe, uh, but you want to coup a non-battleground country in Europe for some reason, uh, but you want to prevent your opponent from being able to coup a rail line in Europe by degrading DEFCON, Duck and Cover can allow you to do that early in the game. Or for instance, if you want to rail line in Europe, which does actually come up on action round one, on turn one of the game, you can rail line in Europe and do your realignment first and then have the event trigger so that DEFCON still degrades and goes to four, and then no further coups or realignment attempts can be made in Europe. So the USSR player can do quite a few tricky things, and I think the, the standard thing that the USSR player will do with this card is if DEFCON's at three on their first action round after the headlines have happened, if DEFCON remains at three, the USSR player can play the influence from duck and cover into countries that are important. So for instance, if the US player has done something on their last action round the turn before to cause a problem for the USSR player by say uh, breaking USSR control of a battleground or moving into a new continent like into Colombia uh, in South America as a way from the USA's starting influence in Panama they can move into Colombia and threaten to move into South America that way. The, USA, the USSR player on their first action round can play duck and cover to respond to that threat by for instance cooing Colombia or putting influence into East Germany to repair the, the US damage um, and still degrade DEFCON to deny the USA player the coup. So Duck and Cover is a quite important card as the USSR to allow you to make some of those tricky plays. The downside is that the US player earns victory points equal to five minus the current DEFCON level. So that first type of play that I talked about where you're uh, perhaps realigning in Europe or doing something in Europe when DEFCON's at five, or even for example, cooing Thailand when DEFCON's at five reducing DEFCON to four with your coup, and then to three with the duck and cover effect, or actually you would do it the other way around, to reduce it to four with the duck and cover effect so that the VP uh, gain to the USA player is lower, because the VP gain is lower when DEFCON is higher. So you trigger the event, DEFCON would go from five to four, then you'd coup Thailand, reduce DEFCON to three, which means that the USA player can't respond with their own counter coup of Thailand because you've degraded DEFCON all the way from five to three in one action round. So duck and cover, Yep, can allow you to do those sorts of plays. And the higher that DEFCON is when you trigger it, the fewer VPs that you're giving to the US player. As the USA player, you might sometimes headline duck and cover, um, and that will allow you to deny the USSR player a coup. So often the USSR player, uh, I'm gonna call them the Soviet player, it's a bit easier. The Soviet player will get the coup on their first action round. And you can deny them that by headlining duck and cover. In the early war, um, because of the way that headlines go, that the USA player's headline will go first if the operations values of the cards are equal, um, and the higher operations value card will always go first. There are no four operations card value cards in the early war that degrade DEFCON, so it's always safe for the USA player to headline duck and cover if DEFCON is at three or higher. And they might do that on turn two or three to deny the USSR a coup, um, or they might do it when DEFCON is at five to deny the USSR player on turn one, the opportunity to coup Italy, for example. It's not the most powerful turn one headline for the USA, but 
it can serve that purpose of protecting Italy a little bit. So I might move on to the second card, NATO. Uh, so NATO is quite a confusing card. When you're first sitting down looking at the game, I think the amount of text on this card and sort of the, the many qualifications on it can be a little bit confusing. So the first thing to pay attention to is that unlike duck and cover, it's a start event, which means that if the event happens, it's uh, removed from the deck entirely. The other thing to consider is that it's a four operations point card. So there are five four ops cards in the early war. Three of them are blue. You can see here uh, NATO, Marshall Plan, and US-Japan Mutual Defense Pact, and two of them are neutral. So NATO is one of the five four operations value cards in the early war deck, and it's very important for that reason. The other reason it can be important is that the effect of it, which says USR pl USSR player may no longer make coup or realignment roles in any US controlled countries in Europe, can be quite important in the mid war, um, in the main uh, and in the late war as well. It, it can protect you from coups and realignment attempts in France, particularly and, and in Italy, which can be quite important. But more importantly, US controlled countries in Europe may not be attacked by play of the brush war event, which specifically protects Italy in the main from bringing brush war in the mid war or the late war. So that effect can be quite important. The other thing to note, which we'll see later, is that it, it enhances the effect of the card's special relationship if NATO is in play. All of that being said, NATO is a little bit hard to get into play because it can only be the event can only happen after Marshall Plan or Warsaw Pact formed, which are two other cards in the early war deck, have been played for their event. So in order for the NATO event to occur, usually it'll be that the because it's a four ops card, the USA player will rarely play it for the event. So even if Marshall Plan or Warsaw Pact have already been played, it's rare that the USA player will give up on the four operations points to get this event. So what will usually happen, or the, the usual way that NATO will actually occur, is if, for instance, the USA player headlines Marshall Plan on turn one, or plays Warsaw Pact early on turn one, and then the Soviet player plays NATO to try and use the four operations points. In that case, the NATO event will go, will happen. Uh, but if Marshall Plan or Warsaw Pact haven't already been triggered, then the NATO event won't happen, and the card is just a blank four ops card. So I think that's probably all that needs to be said about that. I guess if you're the USSR player and you have NATO in hand and neither Marshall Plan nor Warsaw Pact have been triggered, you probably want to use it earlier in the turn rather than later, just to um, mean that there's fewer opportunities for them to for the USA player to play either of the trigger events. Containment is the next card. So this is actually quite an important one in the early war deck. It's one of the best US headlines in the early war uh, and it adds one to all further operations cards played by the US this turn. So it basically turns any two operations value card into a three operations points card. Um, it turns a one into a two, and it turns a three into a four. It has a maximum of four, which means that the fours don't become fives. So that's just one thing to keep in mind, but containment is a really good card to play if you've got a number of cards in your hand that you think you are going to play for operations points. And most of the US cards, when the US player has them, they're going to actually play them for the operations points rather than for the event in the early war, because the US events are a little less powerful. Uh, but all the cards tend to be reasonably high in terms of operations points. Um, the other thing it can do is it means that if you've got some neutral cards or some of your opponent's cards in hand, it can make them easier to send to space. So it means that you can space race, for example, one operations point Soviet cards, which otherwise you would definitely have to play. So that's one thing that containment can allow you to do. In general, it's just a very good headline. As the USSR player, you can deal with containment quite easily by just playing it on your last action round. You still have to give the US player, because they get to go last after your last action round, you still have to give them one action round of the containment bonus, but really that's not really too much to give up. So Containment, definitely a good US card, but relatively easy for the Soviet player to deal with by just playing it in their last action round. East European Unrest is another one that is not very powerful as the US to events. Like you'll never give up on the three uh, operations points to really play it for the event unless you're in the late war, in which case it becomes more powerful. So rather than removing one USSR influence from East European countries, it removes two from each of those countries in the late war. But in the early and mid-war, you'll rarely ever see the US player event this. 
Oftentimes the Soviet player can afford to play this and not send it to space because they'll usually have additional influence in their East European battlegrounds that they can afford to have removed. So this isn't too bad a one for the Soviet player to draw, although you don't really want to be triggering it twice in the early war. So if you draw it on turn one or two and then again on turn three, it can get a little bit problematic unless you've had some specific cards from your deck, uh, sorry, from your Soviet pool, such as Warsaw Pact Formed, which we'll come to later, um, or Comic-Con, both of which add additional influence to the USSR player's East European battlegrounds. All in all, this is just a nice one for the US player to draw because it's a safe three operations points, which the US player can always use in the early war. The next card is Special Relationship, um, which is another kind of confusingly worded one and leads to some odd sequencing because uh, you can try and spend too much time trying to make the effects happen rather than just focusing on using it as a two ops card, which is really what it is most of the time. So as the USA player, the event in its first mode, so if you control the UK, but NATO is not in effect, you get to add one US influence to any country adjacent to the UK. Now, you start with five US influence in the UK, so you're always going to have access to those other countries, so it's not giving you any additional access. And playing it as an event for that first mode just means you're giving up on one influence, one operations point. So you, you're never going to do that as the US player, you're always going to just play it for the two operations points. If the Soviet player plays Special Relationship and you get one free US influence, for instance in France or in Canada, that can be helpful. So as the Soviet player, sometimes you'll space this just to avoid giving the US player one free influence in France, for example. You'll almost always space it if you're the Soviet player and NATO is in effect and you draw it because then the US gets to add two US influence, not just to countries adjacent to the UK, but anywhere in Western Europe, which includes the Mediterranean non-battleground countries. It also includes Italy and it includes France. Um, and generally giving the US two free, Italy, two free influence anywhere in Western Europe is just a little bit too strong. They also get two victory points, crucially. So that upgraded version of the special relationship, if NATO is in effect, is a very, very powerful card. And the US player will often play it for the event if it's on the upgraded version rather than just for the two operations points. Five-year plan is... I often say a red card in disguise uh, because it's one of those cards if you're the Soviet player and you draw it, it's actually very, very good for you and it lets you do some really sneaky things. So what 5 Year Plan says is USSR player must randomly discard one card. If it's a US associated event, the event occurs immediately. If it's a USSR associated event or an event applicable to both players, so if it's either a neutral card or a red card, then the card must be discarded without triggering the event. So what the USSR player can do is they can hold on to a scoring card until it's the last card in their turn in their hand other than five year plan. Then they play five year plan triggering the event and what the event forces them to do is discard that scoring card without triggering it because it's a neutral card. So they can actually it's one of the ways that the Soviet player can avoid playing unfavorable scoring cards. Uh, which you'll often see happen in the early war with Europe scoring. So the US player might set up Europe domination and then the Soviet player might five-year plan away the Europe scoring card. And that can be quite a devastating blow and quite a strong uh, victory point swing as opposed to giving the US player five victory points from Europe uh, domination. So that's why I sometimes say five-year plan is a bit of a red card in disguise. It can be a bit dangerous for the USSR player as well. So if you're holding, for instance, a DEFCON suicide card like CIA created or Duck and Cover, and you hold five year plan and then all you've got left in your hand is five year plan and Duck and Cover and DEFCON's at two, then you've lost the game. So you do have to be careful of that because if you have US associated events or blue cards and you're a Soviet player and you play five year plan and it forces you to discard your last blue card and trigger that event. If it's an event that's going to kill you or be really bad for you, then you know that can kill you or be bad for you. So you have to be quite careful. As the US player, you rarely play it for the event, although sometimes you'll want to cut their hand size. So it can be good if you know what's in their hand, for instance, because you've CIA created and seen their hand, um, or if you uh, know just from 
tracking cards that they've got a particularly unfavorable card in hand, like grain sales to Soviets or something like that, you might um, play this event to cut their hand size so that they're more likely to have to play that unfavorable card rather than being able to hold a card over, particularly if they don't have the China card as a buffer for their hand size. So five-year plan, but the most common use case for five-year plan is for the US player to play it for the three operations points. Uh, but yes, really for the Soviet player, you get a lot more flexibility out of the actual event text. Independent Reds is a bit of an underwhelming event. It doesn't really do much. It, it allows you to equal the USSR influence in one of the non-battleground countries in Eastern Europe. The USSR player doesn't start with influence usually in any of these countries and they can avoid placing their starting influence in them, which means that they can trigger independent reds as the Soviet player on turn one and two usually without any penalty. The usual interaction though that can be favorable for the US player is if the US player or the Soviet player events Romanian abdication early, which gives the USSR player sufficient influence in Romania for control of Romania then the USSR player plays independent reds or draws it on a subsequent turn, then they have to give the US player three influence in Romania to match their Romanian abdication influence. That then means that if Truman Doctrine is played at a point after that, uh, you remove the USSR influence and the US player gets to control Romania by not really having made much investment. And Romania is adjacent to the USSR on the board, which means that it's worth a victory point every time you... Uh, Europe is scored. So independent reds can play some role in giving the US player control of Romania for very little opportunity cost, but in most games it will just be triggered by the USSR player for no loss, uh, or rather for no gain for the US player, um, and or the US player will just play it for the operations points. Very rarely will you see the US player actually trigger, triggering the event manually. CIA created is a really important card to pay attention to in the early war deck because as the Soviet player it's one of the ways that you can lose the game. Um, so what it says is one operations point so it can't be spaced which makes it really hard to deal with if you're the Soviet player and you draw it. Um, it's removed from play if used in a, as an event because it's got a star, an asterisk, and it says USSR reveals their hand this turn then the US may conduct operations as if they played a one-op card. So what that means is that the US player can coup, realign, place influence, do anything that they would want to do as if they played a one-op card, but they're doing it in the Soviet player's action round. That means that if the US player uses this one operations point to conduct a coup that degrades DEFCON to one, then because it's the Soviet player's action round, it's the Soviet player that loses the game. And I know that's a bit a lot to get your head around, but what it basically means is that because the rule says whoever's action round it is when DEFCON gets degraded to one, if the Soviet player gives the US player the opportunity to make a coup in the Soviet player's action round, the Soviet player is risking losing the game. So the, the way, only ways that the Soviet player can get rid of this card if they draw it is by playing it without losing the game, is by playing it uh, when DEFCON's higher than two, so that if the US player does coup a, a battleground country with their with this card, then the DEFCON doesn't get degraded to one and the Soviet player doesn't lose the game. The only other way they can do it is if the Soviet player doesn't have any influence in regions where the US player can conduct a coup when DEFCON's at two. Because remember, you can't coup in the Middle East, Asia, or Europe when DEFCON's at two. So if DEFCON is at two and the USSR player has no influence in Central America, South America, or Africa, and they don't start the game with any influence in those regions, then they can safely get rid of this card even if DEFCON is at two. So it's something really important to pay attention to and be aware of as the Soviet player. As the US player, unless it's very late in the game, say past turn seven, and there's no opportunity for this to get shuffled back into the deck, then you'll usually just play this for one operations point and try and get it shuffled back in and hope that the Soviet player draws it again later because it is such a painful card for the Soviet player to try and deal with. And the later in the game it is, the more difficult it is for them to deal with it because they're not going to have the opportunity to trigger it before they get influence in those uh, South America, Central America and Africa regions because by turn seven, of course, they'll have some influence in at least one of those regions. Formosan Resolution is a 
thanks for the like, Sam. Uh, much appreciated. Um, Formosan Resolution is a an interesting card that doesn't tend to actually do a lot. Um, it's got a lot of text and it sounds like it's going to be helpful, uh, but in a lot of circumstances, really, the investment for taking control of Taiwan as the US player is three operations points, and you can rarely actually afford to make that extra investment. And if you do, you can still lose the benefit of this card as soon as you play the China card. So what it says is, Taiwan is treated as a battleground country for scoring purposes. If the US player controls Taiwan when the Asia scoring card is played or during final scoring at the end of turn 10. Taiwan is not a battleground country for any other game purpose. So for kitchen debates or other, other cards that count battleground countries, it doesn't count. Only for Asia scoring and for final scoring. This, card effect, this card's effect is cancelled after the US player plays the China card. So if the Soviet player triggers this on turn one, for example, and then the US player invests some operations points in taking control of Taiwan, and then at some point later in the game, the US player gets the China card, the US player just can't play the China card or they risk losing this effect in Taiwan and having in a lot of ways wasted those three operations points they spent uh, taking control of Taiwan. So in most games, you'll see this get triggered for the event and then the US player still pretty much ignore Taiwan because being able to play the China card is generally just better. That being said, I did play a game earlier today uh, for those of you who are watching on the stream where I did actually take control of Taiwan after this, get, this card was in effect because it did change the balance in Asia a little bit and it allowed me to neutralize the Soviet advantage there. So it does come up from time to time, but it's not one of the more powerful US events in the game. The next card though is extremely powerful and you'll often see this as being one of the main Soviet targets for space racing in the early war if they draw it. So what NORAD says is, again, this is quite confusingly worded, but it's pretty simple once you get your head around it. If the US player controls Canada, remembering that the US starts with two influence in Canada, so they need to put an extra two into Canada at some point in order to control it. If the US controls Canada, the US may add one influence to any country already containing US influence at the conclusion of any action round in which the DEF CON marker moves to the two box. So two important things to note about that. It needs to be an action round. So if DEF CON degrades to two in the headline phase, no round doesn't trigger. It'll only trigger in an action round. The other thing to note is that it needs to be, this free influence can be placed in any country anywhere on the board that already has US influence in it. So that's an extremely powerful effect. And it means that if you, for instance, got one influence in Pakistan uh, and the Soviet player has three, so they control Pakistan, if they then coup in their action round one and degrade DEFCON to two, you get to place a free influence in Pakistan to break their control and then you get to have your action round straight away, which means you can then flip Pakistan because it's no longer controlled by the USSR player. So what NORAD really does is once it's in effect, it forces the USSR player, the Soviet player, to over control all of their battlegrounds where you already have influence. So that can really force them to commit some extra um, influence beyond that what they would want to. So we've got a question here from Bada who says, how quickly would you put the influence into Canada if you had NORAD as the USA? Pretty much straight away, I would try and do it on the same turn. So if NORAD gets triggered on turn one, um, I would try and control Canada by the end of turn one so that I get the maximum number of turns of the NORAD benefit. The other thing to note is that NORAD is cancelled if either player triggers the Quagmire event. So if the, US, if the Soviet player plays Quagmire for operations but they don't trigger the event, then it doesn't matter. But if either player plays Quagmire and the event occurs, then no rat is immediately cancelled. Um, so what that means is that you can be sure if no rat is played on turn one, um, that you're going to get the no rat benefit on turns two and three, but as early as turn four, it could get taken away from you um, as the USA player. So you want to try and get as many turns out of it as possible. So to answer your question, Varda, um, I would put the influence into Canada, obviously assuming that there's there's always other priorities, but assuming there's no other pressing priority, um, Canada would suddenly become one of the pressing priorities for me as the US player, as soon as no red is triggered, just because that free influence can be so important. Another reason that, that, uh, that no red can be really important is that it rewards you as the US player for doing things that you want to do, which are already good, and that is using your last action round to try and cause a problem for the Soviet player that they need to respond to in their next turn. And what I mean by that is if you use 
say, two influence to place one influence point, in, or two operations points, rather, to place one influence into a country that the Soviet player controls on your last action round as the US player, normally that does cause them a problem, but it's not a huge problem and they can maybe repair it in their next turn. You know, before, yes, it might cause them a bit of a, um, a crunch where they've got to choose between cooing on their action round one or repairing, for instance, control of Pakistan or control of Iran or something else. Um, but they can generally repair it. But what NORAD does is it makes that even better because that one influence you've placed in the country that they control is now not just one that they have to repair, but one that threatens NORAD influence being placed as well um, at a later date. So you get additional benefit for breaking control of Soviet countries when NORAD is in, a, in, a, in effect because your influence that you've kind of seeded in there is also an, an additional threat from NORAD as well. So Truman Doctrine is probably, I mean, it's hard to say what the most powerful of anything is, but I'd say Truman Doctrine is probably the most powerful event or leads to both the biggest swings when it's played, um, but also can lead to can kind of shape the way the Soviet player, as your opponent plays, more than any other card in the US deck here. Um, the reason for that is that it massively disincentivizes the Soviet player from becoming aggressive in Western Europe. Because once you control West Germany, France, and Italy, if you can get that sorted out pretty early on turn one, they are disincentivized from trying to conduct some kind of operations placing race in Western Europe because you've got this trump card where you can just say they spend a four up card, putting three into West Germany after you've already got four there. You can just play Truman Doctrine straight away, kick them back out, and they've wasted a four up card. Um, or you can, you know, respond a little bit differently, bait them a bit, get them to try and place even more in West Germany, and then Truman Doctrine them out. So it's it can be really effective defensively, but it can also be very effective offensively as well. Especially once Warsaw Pact is out of the way, which we'll come to in a moment, which is effectively the USSR's version of Truman Doctrine in terms of defending their East European battlegrounds. Um, but if you use Truman Doctrine offensively, it would be, for instance, to remove the influence from Romanian abdication after independence reds has been played, as we talked about before. Um, or it might be that you place some influence into Poland with some of the mid-war and late-war events that let you do that, and then you Truman Doctrine them out of Poland, and all of a sudden you control it. Um, you can also just jam into East Germany. I do that sometimes in the early war if I've got a big operations advantage. Just place influence into East Germany and then Truman Doctrine them out um, if they don't respond. That is a little more risky before Warsaw Pact is played, as we discussed earlier, but even even then, they have to draw Warsaw Pact, they have to event it, and they just kick you out. If they do that, they don't actually get control of the country back straight away. So I still sometimes will do that. But yeah, Truman Doctrine is a very important one, both to be aware of as the USSR player, but also as the US player to kind of use either defensively or offensively as the game circumstances require. Marshall Plan is the card that lets you place the single most number of influence of any card in the game. So it's very powerful as well. The downside is that only three of the countries that you can place in are particularly relevant, although the others are also relevant. So the three Western European battleground countries, that is France, Italy, and West Germany, are all great places to place your Marshall Plan influence. You can only place one in them, and you can only place in them if the Soviet player doesn't control them. So those are some significant uh, downsides, which means that if you're falling behind in Europe, Marshall Plan doesn't necessarily let you recapture battlegrounds. What it does do, though, is on turn one, let you solidify your Western European position. Um, it also allows you to solidify your position in the Mediterranean countries by getting a free influence in Turkey, Greece, and Spain and Portugal, so that it's very hard for the USSR player or the Soviet player to actually get ahead of you in country count in Europe. So Marshall Plan is a very, very powerful event on turn one. It gets less powerful as the game goes on and as the free influence in the battleground countries in Western Europe becomes less relevant, although it is always one that you're happy to see as the US player just because it gives you so many influence because seven is just, as I said, more than any other card in the game gives you. It's another one that's removed from play if it's played for the event and also it does allow play of NATO as we discussed earlier. So it's just something to keep in mind but really it's the main event itself that is what you kind of want to be paying attention to the most. US-Japan Mutual Defense Pact. 
So it says, US gained sufficient influence in Japan for control. USSR may no longer make coup or realignment roles in Japan. So this is just a reason that the Soviet player will rarely play into Japan. Again, in my game earlier today, my opponent did take Japan, and that's because I drew it in the early war as the US player. I didn't play it for the event. Uh, I didn't take control of Japan, and then my opponent drew it on turn 7, I think, which meant that it was never going to come back into the game, and they could safely take Japan, knowing that they could send this to space, and it was never going to come back. Um, that's pretty much the only circumstance where the USSR player will take Japan, unless they're feeling very bold and they want to do it early and hope that they draw it. Um, what this usually says is that the US player is probably going to get control of Japan at some point in the game. And certainly if the USSR player draws this in the early war, the four operations points is usually going to be far too tempting and also worth far more victory points in the long run than what the USSR player loses by giving the US player Japan. So usually as the USSR player, you'll just think, Japan's probably going to be US at some point in the game, and I'm going to use these four operations points to get me further ahead elsewhere on the board. And that's certainly how I see it when I'm playing as the Soviets. So it's one that you'll often see the USSR player play, and it's one that you'll almost always see the US player play for the operations as well, because it's just a little more flexible than playing it for the event. Defectors is, while I said Truman Doctrine, is probably the most powerful event overall, although CIA and Marshall Plan are both also very good, and so is NORAD. Um, Defectors is one of the most important and defining cards in the game, and that's because when it's played for the event, it doesn't go away, so it keeps coming back. And it says, play in the headline phase to cancel USSR headline event, including scoring card. Place the cancelled event card in the discard pile. If defectors played by the USSR card during a Soviet action round, the US gains one VP, unless they space it. So it's powerful for the US player to draw because they can cancel the Soviet headline, and particularly on turn one, you know, defectors cancelling the Soviet headline for that first little impetus uh, of tempo in the game is really important. Um, but the threat of defectors also means that the Soviets can't just, in a carefree way, headline their best card every turn. Um, knowing that they're going to get headline turn one uninterrupted. Defectors is a way that the US player can interrupt it. It's something that the USSR player, if they don't know where Defectors is, they have to honour it, and they have to really think carefully whether they're willing to risk their best card in a headline phase, knowing that they could lose it to Defectors and that the effect could be cancelled. So Defectors plays an important psychological role in the game, and it plays an important role in moderating the power of the Soviet advantage having headline and action round one back to back. It also sometimes gives the US player some victory points if it's played by the Soviet player, which means that even if it's drawn by the Soviet player, the US player doesn't completely lose out. The neutral cards in the early war are a little simpler. So the China card will always begin the game with the USSR player, um, it's really powerful. It means the USSR player starts with a guaranteed four op card if they really need it on turn one, or five operations if it's used in Asia. It's the only five op card in the game when you're cooing, uh, which means that in the first turn, particularly, if the US player tries to move into Pakistan or Thailand while DEFCON's still at four or higher, the Soviet player has this really powerful coup opportunity to coup Thailand or Pakistan if they want to. Um, Asia scoring, Middle East scoring, and Europe scoring are the three scoring cards that are available in the early war. Obviously, they differ slightly in terms of points, but all the scoring cards do mainly the same thing. You'll see that Asia scoring and Middle East, sorry, Asia scoring and Europe scoring are worth seven points for domination as opposed to three for presence. So that's a four operations point difference, sorry, four victory point difference, whereas Middle East scoring is only three and five. So it's only a two victory point difference. So generally, an Asia and a Europe domination are going to be worth more victory points to the dominating player than a Middle East scoring. So if you're one battleground country ahead with your domination in the Middle East, you'll only score three victory points if you play the scoring card. If you're one battleground country ahead in Asia, you'll score five, and same in Europe. So Asia and Europe are richer in terms of points, um, but they're also harder to impact because of the DEF CON restrictions um, and also because, in Europe's case, of the limited number of battleground countries. Captured Nazi Scientist is an important one because the first space race box is so important. 
because it's a 2-1. And the third space race box is so important because it's a 2-0. So the first player who gets there gets two and the second player gets nothing. Captured Nazi scientist, by getting to advance a space race um, box automatically, gives you an important advantage. It also doesn't count as your space race for the turn. So it's effectively a free advance in space. Um, and for that reason, especially since a one, it's a one-op card, it will almost always get evented in the early war. Um, and that means it'll almost always disappear because it's a start event. So it'll get removed once it's played. Indo-Pakistani war uh, is a, another really important neutral card. Um, so it says it's a war card, which means that the player who plays it for the event rolls a dice and they subtract one for each opponent controlled country adjacent to the target. It can only target India or Pakistan. Uh, the player wins the roll on a modified four to six. So if the, if the attacking player chooses Pakistan, for example, and the defending player has no countries adjacent to Pakistan, then the attacking player needs to roll a four or more. If they do, they get two victory points and replace all the opponent's influence in that country with their own. So it's a really powerful swing. It means that all of the influence um, that the opponent has you know, spent time placing in either India or Pakistan suddenly becomes their opponent's influence, which is, can be absolutely devastating. It can obviously be mitigated by the player who moves into Pakistan or India controlling adjacent countries. So the adjacent countries are, in Pakistan's case, Iran, Afghanistan, and India. And in India's case, it's Pakistan and Burma. So you'll note that because India only has two countries adjacent to it, Pakistan and Burma, the maximum, uh, the Indo-Pakistani war can always be used on India because the maximum required can only ever be a six because that's two adjacent countries, goes from four to five to six. Um, so you'll always have at least a one in six chance of flipping India with this war. But Obviously, yeah, as I said, you can mitigate um, the chances of you losing your influence in India or Pakistan to this war by controlling the adjacent countries, which is often why you'll see people play into Afghanistan, or one of the reasons, um, and also why Iran can be quite important as well in terms of controlling that before you move into Pakistan. UN Intervention is a really interesting one. So it says, play this card simultaneously with a card containing your opponent's event. The event as in the other card, is cancelled, but you may use its operations value to conduct operations. Place the cancelled event in the discard pile. This can't be used in the headline phase. So you can't headline you an intervention, important to note. Um, and when you play it, you choose, so if you're the USSR player, for example, and we said that uh, Marshall Plan's a pretty bad one, you don't really want to give the US player that event because it gives them seven free influence, you could play UN intervention alongside it and so you play the event of UN Intervention, and then you get to play Marshall Plan, and you get the four operations points, but you don't have to trigger the event. So it basically allows you to play your opponent's card without triggering the event. The disadvantage is that you're down a card because you've played two cards in one action round. So you have to be a little careful because it's what we call a hand size reducer. That's the one downside to it, but otherwise it's a really good one to have to add some flexibility to your hand. Olympic Games is usually just two ops. The event doesn't really come up that much, partly because it's such a, um, a dangerous one. So it's another one of those cards where you give your opponent a choice. They get to choose to participate or boycott. If they participate, each player rolls one dice with the sponsor, so that's you who played it, adding two to your roll, and the higher roller gets two victory points. You re-roll ties. If an opponent boycotts, degrade DEFCON one level, and the sponsor, that's you who played it, can conduct operations as if you played a four ops card. Obviously, if DEFCON is at two and you play this card, your opponent can just choose to boycott and that degrades DEFCON, you lose the game. So you can never play Olympic Games when DEFCON's at two or you just straight up lose. So that's why you'll only ever really see it played on turn one. Sometimes it might get headlined on turn two, but it's extremely risky because if the other player headlines duck and cover for whatever reason, then you'll lose the game because duck and cover will go first because it's a three ops card. It'll degrade DEFCON to two and then this will give your opponent the opportunity to degrade it to one in your headline phase. So the Olympic Games event will generally only happen on turn one. Um, very occasionally, if the Soviet player is desperate for two VPs, they might play it when on their first action round when DEFCON's at three, but those are probably the only times it'll get played for the event. Usually it's just two ops. Red Scare Purge is one of the more powerful events that always comes back, um, and it's 
possibly, I mean, it'd be, it'd be close to one of the most powerful events in the game. It'd probably be in the top three or four. It's a four ops card, so you're giving a lot away. Like it has a high opportunity cost to play it as an event, but the event says all further operations cards played by your opponent this turn are minus one to their value to a minimum value of one operations point. Now, the important thing to note about that is it reduces the value of the cards as they're in the hand. So it means that if someone could normally space race a two ops card, they now can't because it's worth one op and it no longer meets the space race requirement for a minimum two op card. So it can mean that you can um, force your opponent to play cards they would otherwise try to send to the space race and it also just generally completely um, can have a really devastating effect on their ability to place operations around around the board uh, place influence around the board i should say um, it's in the early war can be really devastating for the us player because the ussr events which we'll come to in a moment tend to be more powerful um, and the US player will generally have to mitigate them by either using the operations value of the card to counter the event um, or by sending them to space. And Red Scare makes it, uh, or sorry, Purge, because the Purge half, if it's the Soviet player playing it, makes it harder for the US player to do either of those things because they won't be able to space two ops cards anymore because they'll now only be worth one. Um, and cards like Socialist Governments will be harder to repair using the natural operations value of the card. As the US player, playing Red Scare for the event can also be really powerful because well, the Soviet player needs to be making the play in the early war. And if you can event Red Scare and stop them from having as many operations available to them, it, it can slow down their spread and keep the pressure off you a little bit. Um, and if, you're, if you have a bad hand as the Soviet player with a lot of two-op cards and suddenly all your two-op cards become one-op cards, it can be really devastating to your ability to actually compete in the early war and certainly to make positive tempo gains. Nuclear test ban is one that will rarely get played for the event. It says player earns VPs equal to the current DEFCON level minus two. So if DEFCON's at two, then the player earns no victory points. Then they improve DEFCON two levels. You, the, the reason this will rarely get played for the event is that your opponent then gets the first use of that DEFCON um, uh, that DEFCON improvement. Um, so if you improve DEFCON from two to four, your opponent gets a coup, which could include in Asia, because DEFCON's now at four, um, and then they pass it back to you. Um, and you are basically at their mercy as to whether you get to still make a coup. The time that that's different is as the Soviet player, if you headline this, obviously you get the first action round, so you can headline it, improve DEFCON, and sometimes you'll see situations where the Soviet player will headline nuclear test ban, even in the mid-war, um, get DEFCON up to uh, five because it starts the turn at three, so get up to five, and then potentially try and do some coups or realignment attempts in Europe. So test ban can be useful to allow some sneaky plays by the USSR player into Europe, but that's pretty much the only time, other than saving yourself from a DEFCON suicide card, that I would play nuclear test ban for the event. The rest of the time, it's just going to be an easy four ops, because uh, four ops cards, as we said earlier, are, there's only five in the early war deck. They're very powerful, uh, very hard to get your hands on. And when you do, you generally want the additional flexibility uh, that's provided by having more operations points at your disposal. So we come now to the USSR cards, which, as I foreshadowed a couple of times, are more powerful than the US cards in the early war and certainly have a lot more impact and they're really important as the US player to be aware of because so many of them can lead to significant swings on the board, um, either shifts in tempo or in the case of things like blockade, just blowouts that if you don't know that they're coming, you can just be like, oh, this game is the worst game I've ever played. How is there a card like this that just is such a complete blowout? But once you know about them, you can play around them and mitigate them. So we'll start off with Socialist Governments, which is a three operations point card. And it says, remove three US influence from Western Europe, no more than two per country. So if you're the US player and you have this card, you play it, the Soviet player removes three influence from somewhere in Western Europe. You've then got three operations points that you can spend, so you can just repair them if you want. So what Socialist Governments can be as the US player, usually, assuming you're not Red Scare Purged, is basically an empty action round. And that's not a bad worst case scenario, uh, or bad normal case scenario, I should say. Um, 
Although there will obviously be times where you're behind on tempo and you can't afford to have an empty action round uh, because you know your opponent's threatening a really favorable score for them or something. Um, so you do have to be aware of socialist governments when it's in your hand as the US player and just kind of manage where you play it throughout your turn. It's also a very reasonable candidate to send to the space race just because it does nothing otherwise and you might as well send it to space if you've got no other urgent space priorities. Eventing it doesn't give you any advantage because it doesn't go away. It keeps coming back because it's not a start event, so you might as well send it to space. As the USSR player, it's a very, very powerful event because on turn one, for instance, it can allow you to dismantle the US control of Italy unless they've got four operations points there or four influence there. And even if they have four, removing two of them makes Italy such a more attractive coup target. So socialist governments is a really wonderful headline for the USSR on turn one. It lets you remove one from West Germany, meaning that you can place influence into West Germany and threaten to go into France. And it also means you can remove influence from Italy, making it a softer coup target. Or if they haven't overprotected it well enough, means you can just walk straight in uh, by denying them control of, of Italy uh, before your first action round. So socialist governments is an excellent headline for the USSR player. Um, in an action round, it's not so powerful because you play it, you remove three of their influence and they can just repair the three. Um, so really it's one of those ones where you want to be playing it as the headline and then leading into your first action round. And that's a bit of a theme with a few of these, such as De Gaulle leads France, which we'll come back to in a moment. So blockade is one that it's just keeps the US player honest, basically. And it says, unless US player immediately discards a three or more value operations card, remove all US influence in West Germany. So it's like, wow. Okay, so the US player usually is going to start with four. Um, and if you're a US player and you haven't been honest and you haven't kept at least a three ops card in your hand to discard to blockade in case your opponent events it and they suddenly event it, you can lose all your four influence out of West Germany, just like that. And that can be really devastating if you've got a bad hand or a low operations value hand. So you have to keep things like socialist governments sometimes back in your hand so that you can discard them to blockade in case your opponent blockades you. The One of the devastating kind of combos in the early war deck is, is if the Soviet player plays Red Scare Purge to reduce the opponent's value of cards in their hand. So the US player's cards are suddenly worth one less operations point in their hand. And then the USSR player plays blockade. The US player actually needs to discard a four or more value operations card to stop blockade from happening. And if they don't have a four ops card in hand, then they're just straight up vulnerable to blockade. And there's nothing that they can do about it. So as the US player, that can also happen to you. Like you can end up with blockade in your hand and you've been purged and you kind of look at your hand and you go, uh, what am I supposed to do? If you don't have UN intervention um, or if you can't hold the blockade for whatever reason, and it can't be your hold card for the turn, then you can be in a lot of trouble. Um, and you might, even if you can hold it, you might need to play some more unfavorable USSR events in order to be able to hold the blockade. So blockade can both create congestion in the US player's hand, but also it's, as I said, keeps the US player honest. Arab-Israeli war can be quite important just because of the way the Middle East is set up at the start of the game, that the US player gets one in Israel um, and one in Iran. And if the Soviet player coups you out of Iran, then Israel is your last remaining influence in the Middle East. And if they also Arab-Israeli war you and take your influence in Israel, then you can be locked out of the Middle East. And you have no other access cards as the US player that allow you to get back into the Middle East until the mid-war. So that can cause you some significant problems. And it's usually why you'll see players who are playing as the US either overprotect Iran or if Iran gets taken by a coup straight away, the US player might immediately spread out into Jordan, Egypt, or Lebanon to protect themselves from Arab-Israeli war, wiping them out of the Middle East entirely. As the USSR player, it's, it's a fine headline on turn one, because if you do succeed on the war in your headline phase, um, you can then coup Iran, and you can potentially wipe the US out of the Middle East before they can do anything about it. So it's a good one to keep in mind. Warsaw Pact formed is, as I said, a bit of a companion card to Truman Doctrine uh, for Eastern Europe, for the Soviets. So it says, remove all US influence from four countries in Eastern Europe, or add five USSR influence in Eastern Europe, allowing no more than two per country. It's a little more powerful than Truman Doctrine in the sense that 
you remove the US influence from four countries in Eastern Europe, regardless of whether the US player controls them or not. Whereas remember, Truman Doctrine only affects uncontrolled countries in Europe. So remove all USSR influence from one uncontrolled country in Europe. So even if the US, the USA player, for some reason, controls East Germany in the early war, you can use Warsaw Pact to kick them out, which is pretty good. Um, and it means that the US player is disincentivized, just like Truman Doctrine, from jamming into the Western Europe, sorry, into the Eastern European battlegrounds. The other mode for Warsaw Pact is also helpful for the Soviet player, and it's that the Soviet player gets to add five USSR influence in Eastern Europe, which can go into those battleground countries to help you overprotect. So even if the US player tries to dispose of Warsaw Pact quickly, uh, before they've bothered putting any influence into Eastern Europe, the Soviet player still gets this alternate mode, which is to overprotect their battleground countries in Eastern Europe. And that can be very helpful as a kind of defensive mechanism to disincentivize further US forays into Eastern Europe. Then we come to decolonization, which is another recurring event. And this is one of the two key Soviet power cards in the early war. So very, very important to keep track of where this is at all times in the early war as both players. The reason this is so powerful is it says add one USSR influence in each of any four African and or Southeast Asian countries. So that's a huge number of countries. Africa, you've got that whole region. Southeast Asia, you've got key countries like Thailand. You've got countries like Burma, which border India and allow the Soviet player to then access back into India and Pakistan. Um, and you've got a lot of one influence countries like, sorry, one stability countries like Laos and Indonesia. Um, that can allow the Soviet player to get easy access to control those countries. There are also a lot of one stability battleground countries in Africa, which means that if the Soviet player places an influence in Angola, for example, they control the country and it's harder for the US player to move through there into Zaire, which is also adjacent. So uh, it also allows the Soviet player to get into Nigeria, which is a one stability battleground in the center of Africa that's otherwise quite difficult to access without getting cooed on the way. Um, so all in all, decolonization just gives you excellent access all across really important regions of the board where it's otherwise difficult for you as the Soviet player to get to. For that reason, it's almost a never play as the US player. So you will almost always, if you can, hold this or space it as the US player. You will rarely ever play it for the two operations points because what you're giving to your opponent is worth so much more than two operations points. Um, the one thing to keep in mind about both this and destalinization, which are sometimes referred to as the D cards because they're both begin with the phrase D um, and are both very important access cards for the USSR player is that the US player, if you draw them on turn one or two, you should try and hold them through to turn three so that you can then space them on turn three. Because if you can do that, then you're denying the USSR player the opportunity to draw them at any point up until turn seven. Because the deck is going to be reshuffled on turn three and on turn seven usually. Um, if you can hold it to turn three, which means that first reshuffle has happened, the deck is usually not going to be reshuffled again till turn seven which means that when you space decolonization in your turn three, it's not coming back again till turn seven. And that is often you know, far too late for it to be as powerful, certainly, as it can be in the early war. Whereas if you space it on turn one or two and your opponent redraws it on turn three, they still get amazing access to Africa before Africa is ever going to be scored. So you want to avoid that as much as you can. We'll go straight to desalinization, even though we were doing a kind of left to right, left to right before. We'll, we'll do a little stake this time because it follows on so well from decolonization. And it says it's a three operations value card. This one is starred, so it goes away once it's used. And it says USSR player may relocate up to four influence points to non-US controlled countries. No more than two influence may be placed in the same country. So relocate means that the USSR player needs to pick up influence that they've got somewhere else. It'll usually be in Eastern Europe because either because of Warsaw Pact or Romanian abdication or for some other reason, the USSR player has extra influence in Eastern Europe. They'll then pick up four of those and put them anywhere else on the map. So it can be South America, Central America, Southeast Asia, wherever, as long as the countries aren't US controlled. So this is an incredible access card. It's the only way in the early war that the Soviets can get into South America or Central America. 
it's one of only three cards, I think, that allow them to reliably get into Southeast Asia, along with decolonization and Vietnam revolts. Um, and it's just a very, very important card to deny them if you're the USA player. And if you're the Soviet player, you never want to play this for the three influence. You always want to play it for the event because over the course of the game, the relocation of those four influence points is almost always going to be worth more than the three operations. This is probably the most powerful event in the game. So as the Soviet player, you always want to play it. As the US player, you always want to deny this to them almost at all costs which means you would space decolonization usually, you would trigger if you had to choose between triggering one of these, you would usually trigger decolonization first um, and try and hold or space destalinization. De Gaulle leads France is the next one, which is very important for the Soviets to have a way to get, so there are two cards, De Gaulle leads France and Suez Crisis, which I call often the France attack cards that allow the Soviet player to attack France and therefore the key third European battleground, keeping in mind there are five European battlegrounds, so whoever controls three is at a significant advantage. There are three in Western Europe and only two in Eastern Europe, meaning that the US player has a natural advantage in Europe because a lot of their cards affect Western Europe, whereas a lot of the good Soviet cards only affect Eastern Europe. De Gaulle leads France is a way for the Soviets to punish the US for actually investing influence in France and therefore in that key third battleground country on the US side. It's a way for if the US player only has three influence in France, which is sufficient for control, if the Soviet player headlines de Gaulle leads France, it actually turns it from being three US influence to zero Soviet. Uh, suddenly it's one US influence, one Soviet, and then the Soviet player on their first action round can just play a three ops card to take control. So it allows you to flip France using a headline action round one combo. Um, and in general is just something that is quite powerful that the US player needs to be aware of and consider overprotecting France because of. Comic-Con is a bit of a less powerful event. It's kind of a half Warsaw Pact, if you like. It's add one USSR influence in each of four non-US controlled countries in Eastern Europe. So it's not as good as Warsaw Pact because Warsaw Pact can actually add USSR influence anywhere in Eastern Europe, no matter whether they're controlled by the US or not. Um, and it's got the no more than two per country limit, whereas Comic-Con is only one per country and it's only in non-US controlled countries. But it is another way for the US USSR player to get free influence in the early war. So you're still happy when your opponent plays it most of the time. It is worth three operations points. So as the US player, you usually find to have this in your hand. You rarely ever space it. You're usually happy to give them the four influence in uh, Eastern Europe because, as we said earlier, um, there being three battleground countries in Western Europe means that you're already at a natural advantage and this won't allow the Soviets to actually find that third battleground country because it only allows them to place influence in Eastern Europe. It also goes away once it's played because it's a start event. Korean War is another really important one because it's a Soviet event, so therefore the US can't um, take advantage of it, unlike with Indo-Pakistani War, where either player can use it because it's a neutral card. So it's actually something that disincentivizes the Soviets from going into Pakistan and India early, uh, because the US player can actually flip them with the war, whereas Korean War being a red card, only the Soviets can get the advantage of it. Um, it says North Korea invades South Korea, um, basically like all the war cards, every country adjacent, is minus one to the die roll, and on a modified four to six, the USSR player gains two VPs and flips South Korea from US influence to USSR influence, um, to the extent that there's already US influence there. Which means that if the US player are very early in the game, they start with one in South Korea. If they add a further two to take control of South Korea, there's a threat that the Soviet player at any point could play Korean War and turn that three US influence into three Soviet influence, which is a big deal. Um, so the US player needs to be careful of this. Uh, sometimes you'll be able to trigger it, particularly if US-Japan Pact has already been played because Japan is adjacent to South Korea, which means that if the US player controls Japan, it goes from a 50% chance for the Soviet player to succeed in this war to only a 33% um, chance, a one in three. And that's a significant difference. So the US player will sometimes be a bit more comfortable triggering Korean War once US-Japan Pact has been played. 
Um, but in general, it's one that I like to try and space if possible as the US player. As the Soviet player, if it's a one in three, you might still take the chance. So if you've already given them US-Japan patch and you draw Korean War, maybe you still take it if they control Korea. But in general, what it does, it buys you time. It buys you time to actually use a four-up card to take South Korea um, or even to do one in South Korea on turn one if neither player knows where Korean War is. And then the US player will be reluctant to commit the further three required to then take South Korea, which gives you time to actually just place the three because you're at the advantage as the Soviet player where Korean War can't affect you. So you can just place the three in there to control South Korea with basically no penalty. So what this card does is often less for the Soviet player in actually playing the event and more in the threat of what it threatens to do and buying you time to actually control South Korea. Fidel is one that can be quite important because it's worth a lot of victory points. Um, because you'll often, because Cuba is adjacent to the USA, um, you're already at a natural 50 50, even if you control Cuba, for them to realign you. If they can then control Nicaragua or Haiti, which are the two non-battlegrounds that are adjacent to Cuba, then they can get quite advantageous realignment roles. So you'll often see Nicaragua and Haiti be quite hotly contested. Um, but Fidel is a good way for the Soviets and a very important way for the Soviets to gain that foothold into Central America. And because Cuba is adjacent to the US, it's also worth an additional victory point uh, along with being a battleground country whenever um, Central America is scored. Uh, so if you're the Soviet player and you control Cuba, that's actually a really significant advantage. And uh, it's a good one as a Soviet player always to see happen in the early war. Um, and you're generally happy to send it to space um, as the USA or just to not have it happen is kind of ideal. So we're on to the last five cards here. Vietnam Revolts is a, another way for the Soviet player to get into Southeast Asia. Um, as we said, there are three main ways uh, for the Soviet player to do that. Decolonization, destalinization, and Vietnam revolts. But if on turn one, as the Soviet player, you can get Vietnam revolts, it puts you in the box seat to just spread into Southeast Asia. Not only do you get two influence in Vietnam, which is adjacent to Thailand, but for the remainder of the turn, you can add one, to op one operations point to any card that uses all points in Southeast Asia which is incredibly powerful because it also doesn't have that four ops cap. So it means that a four ops card you play into Southeast Asia that turn becomes a five ops card. If you play the China card, you can actually get six operations points in one action round, which is the only way that you can do that in the game. So Vietnam revolts can be very, very strong. Um, as the US player, you usually just trigger it after you've already moved into Thailand in the last action round of the turn so that they don't get to use the benefit at all because you get to go last as the US. It still um, gives the US, uh, sorry, still gives the Soviet player adjacency to Thailand. Uh, usually at some point in the early war, it's very unlikely that this won't get triggered by the end of the early war. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's an important card and the US player can mitigate the, the effect of it a little bit by going into Thailand first. Romanian abdication will also usually be evented by the end of the early war purely because of the fact that it's a one-op card, so it can't be spaced. Um, and the Soviet player is usually probably going to event it rather than using the one operations point because usually just getting the free country in um, Eastern Europe is actually helpful, um, unless independent raids hasn't yet been triggered, in which case they might not. Um, so it says remove all US influence in Romania, USSR gains sufficient influence in Romania for control. It's pretty self-explanatory, it's a free Eastern European country, and it can often be a good way for the USSR to try and set up a turn one Europe domination, which is otherwise a little ops intensive and difficult for them. NASA is another one that punishes the US for spreading into Egypt. So I mentioned at the when we we're talking about Arab-Israeli war that the US has the option to spread to Jordan, um, Lebanon, or Egypt from, uh, from Israel with their starting Israel influence. And NASA just makes it a little more shady for the US player to spread towards Egypt and then to Libya. It removes half of the US influence routed up. So if they have one, it removes the one. If they have two, it only removes one. And it adds two USSR influence in Egypt. So you can still, as the US player, place two into Egypt 
on the first turn. And then even if they play NASA, you still get to retain one. Um, it's just that they get two. So you, you'll often see good players actually place two into Egypt on you know turn one if they have a surplus of ops, which also allows them to move into Libya. As long as DEFCON has obviously been degraded to two uh, and there's no chance of your opponent kind of cooing you out of Egypt when you move there. Suez Crisis is the second of the France attack cards. It says remove a total of four US influence from France, the United Kingdom and Israel. So it's another way that the Soviet player can threaten to wipe the US player out of the Middle East entirely by the time the US player gets to make their first play in the game and their first action round. So if the Soviet player headlines Suez Crisis on turn one, they can remove two from the United Kingdom or any number from France, depending on how the US player sets up. Um, and also the one starting influence from Israel. Then the Soviet player can coup Iran uh, and completely wipe the US player out of the Middle East. So it's a very powerful turn one headline, and it's even more powerful if the US player has set up into France because the Soviet player can then obviously remove not just more influence in total, um, but key influence from a battleground country. It goes away if it's used as the event, so worth keeping that in mind as well. The Cambridge Five, or the other thing I'd say about Suez Crisis is it can remove four and only allow the US player to repair three. Um, so that's as opposed to socialist governments, which is remove three, can add back three. And similarly with the maths on de Gaulle leads France, Suez Crisis is actually more lopsided towards what the event does. So it can be a little more painful and harder to repair. The Cambridge Five is a funny one. It says the US player exposes all scoring cards in their hand. The USSR player may then add one influence in any single region named on one of those scoring cards of the USSR's choice. So if the US player has any scoring cards in hand when this event happens, uh, the Soviet player gets to place influence anywhere in, the, in that region that the scoring card applies to. They don't need to have adjacency or anything like that. So it can be another way that they can access key countries in Asia on turn one um, or access countries in the Middle East that they're not adjacent to. It can't be played as an event in the late war, it's worth keeping in mind. Um, the other thing about it is it's it's kind of one of the weaker but still okay Soviet headlines. Um, you obviously don't know if your opponent has any scoring cards, although on turn two you can sometimes suss out if no scoring cards have been played. The odds are, that, and you have none in your hand, the odds are they probably have one in their hand, um, in which case getting a free influence in the headline phase can be okay, um, but obviously not as powerful as some of the other USSR events that we've already talked about. So this is one that you might see, I don't know, evented in 5% of games or something like that as the USSR player. Oftentimes you'll just see it used for the two operations points by either player. It's very easy for the US player to dispose of. It just means they have to play their scoring cards before they play this and then they just get two free operations points because the event doesn't do anything. So that brings us to the end of the early war cards. Um, Unless anyone on the Twitch chat has any questions before we finish up, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe. We'll have future videos going through the much more substantial mid-war deck um, and the late war deck at some point in the future uh, to continue with our new player content. But if you're enjoying our new player content, yeah, please chuck us a like and subscribe. Feel free to follow us on Twitch so you can join in to any future um, streams that we do live of this sort of content. And uh, we'll catch you next time with some more International Twilight Struggle League games over the next couple of weeks as well. But thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.